politics. But you would concede that changing the rules after the election yes. is, a, is, a, is a violation in, of fundamental fairness. Indeed, Your Honor. And indeed, the changing of the rules would be to say, let's hold an election, then let's figure out what all the counties did, create an amalgam of that, and then apply that standard to the past election. The, only, the clearest way to avoid a problem under the Due Process Clause and under the case law of Roe v. Alabama and, and Briscoe and Griffin is to have the court enforce the law as it's written. And this court has made crystal clear through a series of cases that when it comes to absentee, the, 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 the requirements for absentee voting, there is mandatory requirement with the voter's responsibility to comply with those provisions. And the clearest way Counsel, to avoid it. now I want your sights to that and the law because that's a question I asked uh, uh, contestants to uh, address on rebuttal. So when you cite that, I mean, just what is your authority that it is mandatory and in fact, the change would be to do a substantial compliance instead of strict compliance. Well, Your Honor, I would I would point you to uh, Wickelman v. Uh, City of Glencoe, in which this court said, and I quote, the provisions of election laws requiring acts to be done and imposing obligations upon the elector, which are personal to him, are mandatory. He is personally at fault if he violates them. If his vote is rejected for such violations, it's because of his own fault, not that of the election officials. Such provisions prescribe mandatory conditions precedent to the right of voting. This court has, was clear in Wickelman. I could also point you to Bell, where they cite, where they quote extensively from Wickelman and add additional, uh, additional emphasis to it. But I don't believe there is, any, has, there is any doubt with respect to absentee voting uh, as to the mandatory nature of the requirements on the voter. And if I'm reading uh, Fitzgerald right, that's a case in 1963, is it says that the voters, it's mandatory and they have to comply. If I may quote from Fitzgerald against Morlock, Your Honor, it says, when a citizen makes a good faith attempt to vote, it will not be held invalid except by unequivocal mandate of the law or fraud. That- And then, but then the court goes on and it kind of bifurcates between uh, an act of an election official and also is that then the uh, act of the, the voter. And, 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 and if I may quote from your own party's brief, in uh, the reply brief, I think on uh, the 16th of December, it talks about absentee voting being somewhat different in that it is a convenience afforded to the voters and so far as the acts and duty of the voters are concerned, they must be held mandatory in all their substantial requirements. That's quoting from Bell versus Gamaway and also citing to Wichelman. Mandatory in all their substantial requirements and the insubstantial ones are not mandatory, Your Honor, and it's the insubstantial ones that were relaxed in the metropolitan counties on election night. And it's the reason that there should be a fair distribution across this state. Every county should come very close to applying the same standards. This goes back to McEvan against Prince in 1914 and Erickson against Sammons. They always say, absent fraud, let's get to the will of the voters. And these things, which may look mandatory on the front end, become directory on the back end if they don't go to the essence of the vote or fraud. And that's the way Minnesota has always been. 